Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me on the Fox West Texas Sports Unscripted podcast. I'm your host, Casey Busher, joined now by ESPN's host and reporter, Jen Lada. Jen, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. This meant that I got to curl my hair today. I got to put on a little mascara, um, which is a rare treat in these uh, isolation times. <laughs> Very true. And thinking of these isolation times, it's been such an uncertain time for people across the world, but in the sports industry, there's no sport. So for athletes, coaches, sports reporters, it's, it's been an uncertain and kind of a crazy time. But what impact do you think that, that, that this time is going to have on the future of sports television? God, I really feel like it's too early to tell. Um, until we're back in action, until teams are kind of like back at their training facilities and we start to see evidence that there will be seasons, I think it's going to be hard to know exactly how it's going to affect things. Um, it, you know, it could be astronomically, Casey. It could be like something we've never seen before. You know, there's been talk of there being no college football season. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that we can wrap our heads around that. There's obviously um, been talk of how they're trying to get the Major League Baseball season going. Golf obviously is kind of leading the way, but if you look at golf, it's probably the most unique of all of the sports out there in that it is the most you know, there's the most solitude when it comes to golf. You really aren't necessarily interacting with other people uh, in a, you know, dangerous sort of way. So, um, look, I wish that I could tell you how this is going to affect things, but I just think we have to just kind of wait and see. And if I'm being honest, that's probably the most difficult element of this entire situation, right? I think a lot of people are used to the routine of sports, knowing that when the calendar flips over into April, it means March Madness and the Masters and baseball season. And when the calendar flips to July, you've got the All-Star break. And, you know, like we kind of measure our days and our, and our lives with the sports calendar. And so not having these things it has kind of thrown us into an upheaval. I know a lot of people are like, what, you, what even day is it? What day is it? I don't even know what month it is right now. Have we hit May yet? Are we still in April? Like it's, it's very, very murky. Um, so I think that that sort of like messing with the routine is really like the, the, the impact you're seeing right now. Uh, I've talked to a few professional athletes who are doing their very best to stay motivated, stay in shape, connect with their teams, make sure that they're all up to date. But even that's hard when you're on your own. So many of these athletes, men and women, have been pushed by coaches and mentors their whole careers. And so to now be faced with having to every day get up and get into a routine on your own, motivate yourself, you know, that can be challenging. So I think we're seeing a lot of people who are realizing that they have depended on the structure of sports mm -hmm. to kind of get through their entire professional lives. And that's not there now. It's, it's just crazy to think about. And it's already been, what, 50 days now. I saw a tweet with no sports. So it's been crazy, but we will eventually get through it. But Jen, you've been at ESPN since 2015. Um, you started your career in Rockford, Illinois, went to Milwaukee. Um, but your storytelling is what stands out so much to me about you as a reporter. It's, it's remarkable, and I think that probably along your journey, the stops you've made has improved you as a storyteller, I'm sure. But can you speak on that and talk about your journey and how the stops that you've made along the way has helped you grow as a storyteller? Yeah, my career is one that you could never really plot out, right? Like, I've, I've taken the very standard trajectory of starting out in a small market, graduating to a medium market, graduating to a larger market, graduating to a network regional level, and then graduating to the network. So that, you know, by, you know, most standards is pretty normal. But when I got to ESPN, I was hired for an entirely different position than I'm in. And when I look back at why it's worked out for me, it's mostly because of the breadcrumbs that my career kind of like laid out at each stage, right? So when I was in Rockford, I was tasked with doing a feature called Athlete of the Week. Sounds so simple, right? You go out and you find a high school athlete um, and then you honor them for that week. But, you know, after a while, the stories start to sound all the same. So there was a challenge in making them unique, figuring out what separated each individual athlete beyond their athletic skill from the pack, right? And so that's where it kind of started. You know, you're starting to have to find these different angles, really ask some pressing questions, you know, things other than what's happening on the field of play. Um, when I got to Milwaukee, 
there was this huge emphasis on local stories. We had a nine o'clock newscast and we had a nine o'clock sports cast. And so every single night, me and my two coworkers were tasked with doing a feature Monday through Friday. So that was another, you know, where we were challenged to go out and find the stories that you're not seeing in the box scores and you're not seeing in the newspapers. And again, you're not asking the questions that you've been taught to ask about, you know, RBI and ERA and, you know, fourth and goal and stuff like that. It's more of like, well, why and how and who? And um, I think that is a big part of the reason why I've excelled at storytelling at the network level, because I was doing it at almost every single stage of my career, which again, who would have known that that would have led to me being a features reporter at ESPN and being on college game day and E60 and sports center and things like that. So I feel really lucky. Um, I feel like I've gotten much, much better. I look back at some of the old stories I did and I think, Oh man, if I knew then what I know now, how differently this story would have gone. Um, but I think that's all part of the journey, right? And one of the best things we can do, and Casey, I can only say this with the benefit of hindsight, but one of the best things that we can do is not to be so hard on ourselves, right? I think people who want to excel and want to succeed are often uh, go-getters and sometimes control freaks, and they want to strategize every single stage, and they want to you know, put the chess pieces where they want on the board so they can ultimately get to the other side. And um, I think if you give yourself a little bit more freedom and flexibility to make mistakes at the early stages, not hold yourself to the fire so much, mm -hmm. um, forgive yourself for the things you don't know, um, I think it, you'll be a little bit happier during the journey. My biggest regret is that I was always that person who wanted what's next, what's next. Okay, I got that, what's next, what's next. And what ends up happening is you don't enjoy the phase that you're in. So if I could give any advice on even just that part of this business, it's try regularly, not every day, because we get caught up in the minutia and the challenges of our everyday routine and duties, but every once in a while, look around and be like, you know what? It's pretty freaking awesome that I am where I am right now. And these are the reasons why this is a fantastic spot for me at this stage of my life. And then I think you'll appreciate those stages even more when you get to the bigger stages. That's really important. And I think that's something that a lot of people starting out in the industry need to realize and, and uh, really soak up where you're at in the moment. But um, the, you talk, you spoke about the role that you do now play at ESPN. Um, you're very much immersed into the college football world. So what are some of the ways that you find the heartfelt stories that you come across and what's that relationship building like with players and coaches in college football? That is exactly what it is. It's about building relationships. Um, it's about going outside of your comfort zone. I have colleagues and I have friends who are so much more comfortable um, reaching out to an athlete, reaching out to a coach, reaching out to a GM, um, you know, just to shoot the breeze. Um, I never want to inconvenience people, right? I don't ever want to seem like my needs are more important than their needs, whatever they may be on a given day. So I do have to step out of my comfort zone a little bit more in this role and reach out to those people because those relationships are critical to finding those stories. Um, people aren't telling their most painful experiences, their trauma, to strangers that they don't think they can trust. Um, the good news is when you're on a platform like ESPN, you have a little bit of built-in clout, a little bit of built-in credibility. So even if someone doesn't necessarily know me personally, I do have the, the backing of ESPN and then it's just up to me to make sure that I don't mess it up, right? <laughs> and I don't like disappoint them. Um, and so I think that that's really what it is. It's about um, getting to know people, taking care of people. And that means that when they are, um, in a position to share something with you that you, you know, handle it with care. Um, I always say, these are not my stories. They never have been. Even if I, you know, spend months and months and months putting something together, you know, that airs on one of our biggest platforms, they are that person's stories or that family's stories. And I have to make sure that I treat it with empathy and with care and compassion. And, um, you know, at the beginning, I'm not going to lie, that was a tough thing because, again, you're so focused on the task at hand and kind of getting the piece from point A to point Z. And so sometimes at the beginning, I would miss the, the nurturing of the piece because I was, like, so focused on the details of it. Mm -hmm. um, as I've gotten more experienced in this industry, I've seen how that can really backfire on you. 
Um, and so there are times where I've had to kind of make amends a little bit with people and say, you know, I didn't handle that story as well as I should have. You know, I saw it as, you know, my project, right? And not what it was, which was those folks' stories. Um, and so that's something that I've learned. But I do think that, you know, like anything else, it's a journey. And that, um, you know, I'm lucky that I do get to share these stories, you know, at, at ESPN and on College Game Day and, and on E60. And I hope that I'll just con keep continue growing in that space. And I'm sure this will be kind of a difficult question to answer, but you told so many stories over the years. What is your favorite story that you've gotten to tell? Oh my gosh, that is an impossible story. You know, someday you'll have children possibly and you'll be like asked to choose between your children. And you'll be like, well, which one's, which one's standing closest to me right now? You know, like yeah. that one. <laughs> um, no, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting because the stories take on so many different, um, different uh, tones right? We have some stories that are really uplifting and like you enjoy watching them and you have others that are kind of difficult to get through because of the pain that the subjects have been through. Mm -hmm. um, it varies from day to day. My very first story um, that I ever told at ESPN um, for college game day was about a gentleman who worked um, at the University of Texas. He was a Bevo handler, wonderful young man, who um, had, had gotten cancer and then had seemed to recover from cancer and then unfortunately passed away several years later. Um, that one will always have sentimental value to me because it was the first one I did on the college game day scene. But a week or two later, I did a story um, that brought two families together, one from LSU and one from Auburn, when um, one of the little boys uh, passed away and his heart went to the son of the other family. So rivals on the football field, but now connected by this incredible bond of, you know, kind of sharing the heart of these children. So that was an incredible story to tell. Um, they all mean something to me because I try to learn something from each of them. The most recent story that we've done um, for E60 was on uh, Jordan Palmer who is a quarterback guru of sorts, who is mentoring all of the big names that are up and coming in the NFL at the quarterback position. Like what a cool story that was. Mm -hmm. Right before that, you know, talk about a totally different tone. We did the story with Ryan Holinsky's family, the quarterback at South Carolina, whose brother died by suicide a year prior. So, I mean, right there, you know, you're running the gamut of like emotions and, and accomplishment. But I do think that, um, that those ones that I mentioned are probably the ones that jump to mind as far as some of the coolest stories I've gotten to tell. So storytelling, like you just mentioned, you know, it's all different tones, could be happy, could bring you sadness, but um, something that, you know, everyone loves about sports is that it brings people together. So I'm sure in your role, you've seen that more than almost anyone because you're telling the stories that people watch and they feel close with the people that they're watching it with. Uh, so what, what have you noticed about storytelling and sports that, really do bring people together, especially in a time like this. Oh my gosh, right now, I think we're all looking for outlets. We're all looking for distractions. Um, I don't think we realize how much sports distract us from our everyday lives. Um, that can be a good thing and a bad thing, right? Like I think one of the benefits of this current situation we're in is that we're being forced to exist in our spaces. We're being forced to exist with the people we've chosen to exist with, um, which is really valuable. Um, and, and I think that it's something that I, when I walk away from this, I hope to kind of carry on into this next phase of life. But, it, but that being said, we still want to be distracted. We still want to throw ourselves into the NFL draft, the last dance, Korean baseball, whatever it is that, you know, is capturing people right now. And I think that storytelling has the benefit of being um, evergreen you know, to borrow a term from our industry, which means, you know, it can exist in inf infinity, essentially. Um, you know, a box score or a highlight may not have the longevity or the permanency that a story has, but, you know, you can tell a story over and over and over and captivate a new audience. The other night, just here in our household, um, I mean, my husband is a huge Miami Marlins fan, and he grew up as a fan of Craig Council. Craig Council happens to be the manager of the Milwaukee Brewers, the team that my husband covers here in Wisconsin. So he's always said that he's a little bit starstruck whenever he has to talk to the skipper, which is, which is a funny dynamic in and of itself. But 
we got, we we're sitting at the dinner table and he got to telling the story of Craig Council scoring the winning run in the World Series for the Marlins. And then the story of Rich Donnelly, who was one of the coaches on the Marlins team, whose daughter Amy had died, but they had this phrase, the chicken runs at midnight and how Craig Council had always been known as the chicken because of his you know, awkward batting stance with his arm way up in the air and the wing that flapped there, and how when he scored the winning run in the World Series, the clock had just struck midnight. And like, I got goosebumps as we were sitting there at the dinner, dinner table, and our son, who is 11 years old, who had heard that story before, you know, kind of got to relive it there. Um, so that's the kind of example of something that like happened years and years ago, but like, we all can kind of relate to the connection, the family, the celebration, the tragedy. You know, we all can find pieces in our own lives in those stories. And I think that's why storytelling will always have a place in sports. Definitely agree with that. And a little backstory on you. Did you always want to be a sports reporter? I mean, I'm sure you love the position you're in right now. But looking back, do you, do you think that your younger self would think, okay, I'm going to be on ESPN one day and tell stories. <laughs> um, I don't know. No and yes. Um, when I was very little, I wanted to be a lawyer or a doctor, probably because my parents, you know, we were like, um, you know, middle class. Uh, sometimes money was tight. And I'm sure my parents were like, you need a job where you're going to make a lot of money so that you're never in a position where you have to worry about it, which you know, was their, their intentions were good. Um, but I think as I got older and started to see where my interests were, um, it was always in uh, presenting. You know, at one point I thought I would be a speech writer. At one point I wanted to be a politician. You know, all of these things, you know, um, that involved, you know, talking in front of a lot of people and kind of presenting oneself. Um, I did school plays when I was younger. I was a reader in church when I was young. Um, I was in pageants. So all of those types of things, you know, kind of led me to, okay, maybe you're going to be in the public eye. Maybe you'll be, you know, be able to talk in front of people comfortably. Um, but it wasn't until college when I realized that being a sportscaster was a possibility for women. Um, which again, I tell this all the time, because it sounds archaic mm -hmm. to say that 20 some years ago that this was not a real thing, but it really wasn't. There were not women on every single sports channel. There were certainly not at the local level. There were very few in locker rooms and clubhouses covering teams. My goodness, we're all watching the last dance right now. Mm -hmm. Do you see any women in those media scrums? Do you, right, you, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we're talking about, right? That was the 90s, early and late. I graduated college early 2000s. So, hey, was this, was it a thing? Uh, fortunately, there was such a smattering of women that it was becoming a thing. And I was right on the cusp of when sports departments started to diversify uh, from a gender basis. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, sports departments that had been, you know, very homogenized, you know, white male, white male, white male, white male, white male, white male, all of a sudden became you know, realized that they were missing out on a whole demographic. And so I was very lucky that, you know, as I graduated from school, people were starting to look for women covering sports. Um, so I always feel like I got a little bit of a head start on the, on the pack because of that. That's so interesting to hear about and also leads into my next question. Being a woman in this industry, what are some challenges that, you've, that you have faced along the way, but also what ways are you seeing uh, that the times are changing and that women are breaking in to this industry now more than ever? Yes, yeah, so I think that that can go two ways. Obviously, you're seeing so many more women in the industry. Um, I think early on, and, and I'm, I'm critical of this now, but at the time it felt like it just had to be this way. There were so few positions that I felt like the competitiveness between women was so much higher. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of wanted to stake your claim to a spot and then you wanted to just hold really tightly onto it, right? You didn't want to worry about somebody else coming and stealing that spot. Um, what we're seeing is so many more women in sports now. Therefore, we're seeing that there's just so much more landscape that we can be more supportive. You can definitely start elevating and uplifting other women and not feeling like they're a threat to your real estate, which is a good thing, right? Because yeah. the better, you know, the more women we have, the better, and the more we can share our expertise and our knowledge and our experiences and, you know, help out the next generation. That is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think we still have a ways to go. I still think that this idea that women 
uh, can't analyze sports because they haven't played is archaic, you know? And then I use this example all the time. My gynecologist is a man, but he never had a baby. And somehow I trust that he's going to get me through that process seamlessly, right? Mm -hmm. So if a man can tell me how my biology works, 